TensorFlow, 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 flow, flow. And then even you sneak back. Hopefully you got that one for the outtakes, right? Welcome to Ask TensorFlow. This is the show where we answer your questions about TensorFlow. My name is Lawrence Moroni. I'm a developer advocate on TensorFlow. And with me, I have... Magnus Hützten. I'm also a developer advocate on TensorFlow. We've got lots of great questions coming in from the community. So should we just get straight to them? Yeah, sounds good. OK, so the first question is from user 37890200 on Stack Overflow. I'd love to know how to get a username like that. <laughs> and the question is, when I try to run TensorFlow on Windows using a GPU, it fails with being unable to load some certain DLLs. And I have those DLLs installed, and I have TensorFlow installed, and I've checked. What can I do? Well. There's a number of reasons for this, and it's, it's a common thing in Windows development, like DLL mismatches. But I found the most common DLL mismatch that's really easy to overlook is that when you go to the NVIDIA site to download the drivers for your GPU, the CUDA, and the CUDNN drivers, the website, as it should, will always default to giving you the most recent version of the drivers. But TensorFlow actually needs a specific exact version. And if the most recent version one has passed on from the TensorFlow one, then you're going to get that DLL mismatch. So for example, when I was setting up my own Windows development box, I installed the latest NVIDIA drivers, which at that time were for CUDA 9.1. And because they were the latest, I thought I was OK. Whenever I tried to run TensorFlow and I was getting DLL errors, it took me a little while digging into them to realize that the missing DLL was CUDA RT underscore 90 dot DLL. But when I looked really closely, I had version dot 91 or 91 of that DLL. And as a result, TensorFlow was getting a little bit confused. So when I went back to the NVIDIA site and I looked in their like, historic downloads, their, their archive downloads, I found version 9.0. I uninstalled 9.1. I installed 9.0. And then TensorFlow worked perfectly mm. well. So I did blog about this experience because it was something that you know I've seen a lot of developers having a little bit of trouble with. And I've put a link to the blog post in the, in the comments below and complete with beautiful screenshots. Sounds good. No, we... CUDA problems are very common. Yeah. Definitely. So just make sure that you have the, the, the matching DLL. So yeah. should we take a look at the next question? Yep. So when I try to run a TensorFlow app, I get overloaded with debug messages. How do I turn them off? And this was asked by Dillas on Stack Overflow. So that's a great question. <laughs> Uh, sometimes you can just see them flying, flying past. So it is a great question, DLS. While debug messages are great because they help us understand what's going on in our code, they can also be a bit cumbersome. And it's hard to find our specific error message because of this. So fortunately, there is an easy enough way to turn them off. There is an environment variable called tf underscore cpp underscore min underscore log underscore level. That's you can tell it's false. an environment variable with all the underscores, right? And the caps, right? <laughs> yes. So th this is the way you use it. So you essentially set os.environ, um, you set this environment variable to a specific log level. And the default log level that we have in the system is zero, which essentially means show everything there. Yep. Uh, if you put one there instead, it will filter out info messages. Two will filter out warning messages. And three will also filter out all the error messages. So if you set it to three, as shown in this example, you'll see very little output. And then the nice thing is your own debug messages that you've inserted into your own code, they won't be lost in all the noise. No. OK. So great question. Yeah, Should we is. move on to the next? Absolutely. And the next one is one of my favorites. And it's from Fidelma in Ireland. And she asks, I would like to use TensorFlow, but I don't know Python. Do you have any other languages? And how about Java? Well, Fidelma, thanks for the question. And while we do have stuff in Java, which can be found in the models tree master samples languages Java directory, it does not have feature parity with the Python APIs. And it's more suited for inference from pre-trained models. So I definitely recommend that Fidelma sticks with Python for the time being. But we are working on more, right, Magnus? Yeah. Including like some cool stuff in JavaScript that we'll be talking about soon. Python as well, if you want to use it, is perfectly suited for complex mathematical models. And it's got tons of supporting libraries for that as well. And not to mention, it's really super easy to learn. So I'd recommend that you give it a try if you haven't done so already. But you know, on the team, we'd also really love to get feedback on the languages that people love. Yeah. Right? The, whatever it is that you're programming in and you'd like to see supported in TensorFlow going forward, you know, please let us know and like leave a little note in the comments below. Right? So yeah. should we take a look at the next question? Yeah, let's okay. do that. So the next question is asked by Alexa in Seattle. And the question is, what is the difference between TensorFlow Mobile and TensorFlow Lite? 
Well, as you may know, TensorFlow already supports mobile and embedded development of models using the TensorFlow mobile API. But going forward, TensorFlow Lite should really be seen as the evolution of TensorFlow Mobile. And as it matures, it will become the recommended solution for deploying models on mobile and embedded devices. With this announcement, TF Lite, TensorFlow Lite is made available as a developer preview, and TensorFlow Mobile will still be out there to support production apps. The scope of TensorFlow Lite is quite large, though. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's still under active development. So the developer preview is a constrained platform to ensure maximum performance on some of the most important common models. You mean things like Inception and stuff like that? Are Correct. Right? And MobileNet, so, all the different cool. resolution variants of, of MobileNet. Cool. Uh, but the goal for continued development uh, are, support, are to simplify the developer experience and enable model deployment for a wide range of mobile and embedded devices. Nice. It's really exciting that developers are getting their hands on TensorFlow Lite, and it's going to be great to see what everyone out there can do with it. And to that end, we've actually produced a number of episodes of coding TensorFlow on this very channel, all around TensorFlow Lite. So there's three in the series. One is introducing TensorFlow Lite, how it works, and what you can do with it. One is using TensorFlow Lite on Android, and the other one is using TensorFlow Lite on iOS. So go check them out. I think we've time for one more question. What do you think, Maggie? Yes. One more. And this one's a beauty. It's from David McLean on Twitter. And David has asked, is there a version of TensorFlow for Chrome OS? So David, I assume you're using a Chromebook and you want to start developing on TensorFlow. Now, instead of like hacking your Chromebook to put Linux on it and install TensorFlow, there's a couple of other good options that you should think about. One of them is there's something called Colab, and I've put a link to it below, where Colab is basically a Jupyter notebook in the cloud, and it supports TensorFlow. So you can start on your Chromebook in your browser, writing and testing, training some stuff in TensorFlow. It's actually really, really cool. But if you want to double click a level beneath that, you can also create a VM on GCE, right, on, on using the Google Cloud Platform. And in that VM, you can install Linux, and you can install TensorFlow, and you can start programming TensorFlow right away. And you can shell into that from your Chromebook. And also, when you're doing it this way, you can take advantage of some of the great hardware that's in the cloud, too, like GPUs and TPUs for accelerated your learning. I hope that really helps. And I think there was another option, right, Magnus? There is one more option. One more. If you're a Kaggle user, you know the platform that allows you to test uh, machine learning and data science problems on different data sets? You should really try out Kaggle Kernels. That is essentially a notebook that has lots of packages installed, and you can write all your TensorFlow code in there and try it out. Kaggle Kernels. Kaggle Kernels. I like the sound of that. You can see the link below here. So thanks, David, and that was a great question. So that's it for this episode of Ask TensorFlow. So some great questions. Thanks, everybody. And remember, if you want us to take a look at your questions and have them featured in a future show, be sure to post on social media and use the Ask TensorFlow hashtag, and we'll look forward to seeing them. Thanks, everybody.